Now, um, let's proceed to our next uh, plenary session. So we also have um, actually a guest speaker, um, Attorney Joe Anteris Medalia, creating a workplace culture of data protection and uh, security. So uh, to continue the afternoon session, no, our next speaker will be um, talking about creating a workplace culture of data protection and security. So it's always important to remember uh, that privacy laws are written by people who will help you to engage with stakeholders across the business in protecting um, personal data. Uh, therefore, a culture of privacy should provide a shared understanding of how personal data and uh, should be used to support broader uh, strategic objectives. So um, Attorney Joanne no, is a young lawyer, educator, and data privacy advocate, and she is also uh, currently an attorney at uh, the Enforce, uh, Enforcement Division of the National Privacy Commission and concurrently serves as the policy advisor for the business process outsourcing sector. She is also a certified information privacy professional um, Europe, no? and she holds a Juris Doctor degree from the uh, UP College of Law where she was one of the top students of her batch. Uh, prior to taking uh, up law, she graduated with honors from Ateneo de Manila, where she took up AB communication with double minors in English literature and Hispanic studies. So with a keen interest in technology and international law, she attended a, um, a Academy of uh, International Law Winter School and the uh, Academy of International Law Summer School. So Attorney Joanne is a seasoned lecturer and speaker on data privacy issues. So ladies and gentlemen, Attorney um, Joanne Medalia. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joan Medalia from the Enforcement Division of the National Privacy Commission. On behalf of the NPC, I would like to thank the Chartered Professional in Human Resources Philippines for this gracious invitation. I was asked to talk about creating a workplace culture of data privacy and security. And it is just very fitting because the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the way we do business. Businesses struggled to adapt to work arrangements, including work from home or skeletal workforce. In fact, that is precisely the reason why we are here today in a virtual setting. So while this move meant maintaining the stream of revenues from which the Philippine economy greatly benefits, it also opens doors for new privacy challenges. Yet this is not new. Organizations have always faced privacy challenges, especially at a time when data is considered as the new oil. This is the backdrop wherein the Data Privacy Act was passed in 2012. So before we start talking about how we can create a culture of privacy in our organizations, we need to backtrack a little bit in order for us to understand the very basics of the Data Privacy Act. So for this brief session, I would attempt to discuss first the framework from which we assess every processing of personal information, and second, the obligations of a personal information controller, such as our organizations. And lastly, relate these two on how we can start creating a culture of privacy in our organizations. The former senator, Edgardo J. Angara, in his sponsorship speech for the bill that would become the Data Privacy Act, said that in this digital era, information is the currency of power. It is valuable, coveted, but at a very high risk. We see this a lot in the news. We see high-profile data breaches. We also see how data is being commodified. Let's not go any further. Here in the Philippines, we have 
online lending applications that seem to use personal data as collaterals. So we really see the changing nature and the increasing importance of personal information in the fourth industrial revolution. But we ask the question, what is the right to privacy? So the right to privacy has been described as the right to be left alone, or the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men. It is the right for a person to determine what information about him or her will be released to the public. So it's not really entirely private that you will not let any information about yourself be known to other persons, but it is your right to control the use of that information. All right? So a few key terms uh, that we can find in the Data Privacy Act of 2012 and which will be uh, very important in our succeeding discussions. First is personal information. So what do we mean when we say there is personal information? According to the law, personal information refers to any information, whether recorded in a material form or not, from which the identity of an individual is apparent, from which the identity of an individual can be reasonably or directly ascertained by the entity holding the information, or such information when put together with other information would directly and certainly identify an individual. So we talk about, for example, pseudonymization. For example, if we just mask the data uh, instead of saying the name of the person, we say that person A or person B is an employee of this company. But then when put together with, with other information, we can still determine who that person is, then that would still be considered as personal information. As compared to completely anonymous information, wherein even if we put that information together with other information, it is impossible to determine uh, that specific individual, it, it's impossible to identify that individual, then that would not be considered as personal information. Now, under the DPA, there is also what we call sensitive personal information. So sensitive personal information are, is more protected uh, than personal information because it presupposes that it's possible for us to be discriminated with this information. Examples would be race, ethnic origin, marital status, age, color, religious affiliation, and so on. So when you look at the Data Privacy Act, the list of information that would fall under sensitive personal information is exclusive. Okay? Okay, so we see this slide wherein we can see personal information and sensitive personal information. For example, you have your name, your address, phone number, email address, which could be considered as personal information. But then when you talk about marital status, citizenship, or government-issued uh, numbers and IDs, then that would already be uh, considered as sensitive personal information. All right, so now what is called a data subject? So a data subject is any natural individual whose information is being processed. So note that this only refers to a natural person because the Data Privacy Act of 2012 protects the fundamental right of privacy the fundamental human right of privacy. And as such, only natural persons can be data subjects. You may ask, how about data of organizations? Personal data of organizations may, uh, may still be considered 
as personal information if an individual can be identified by using that information. All right? So otherwise, it will not fall under the DNA. Okay. So when we talk about processing of personal information, so what do we mean? Okay, so we keep repeating the term processing of personal information when we talk about the Data Privacy Act. So here what we meant is that processing is any operation or any set of operations performed upon a personal data. So this involves your whole personal data life cycle. So including but not limited to the collection, recording, organization, storage, updating, modification, etc. So the whole the whole thing, when you collect, that's already processing of personal information. When you store data, even if when you do not use it, that's still considered as processing of personal information until disposal of personal information. All right? So next is that personal information controller. So what are personal information controller? By the term itself, it, it means that it controls the means and methods of processing personal information. For example, our organizations. When we are uh, an employee of an organization, then our employer is a personal information controller because it collects data for us, uh, for them to process our payroll or um, for employment purposes, right? And that is why they're considered as personal information controllers, okay? So the key here is the determination of the means and methods of personal information. And specifically the question, why? Why do they collect personal information? So only the personal information controller can answer that, okay? So for example, in the case of our employers, of course, they collect our personal information to carry out the terms of the employment contract, all right? Next is personal information processor. So what's the difference? A personal information processor is only asked by the personal information controller to process data. Um, so in this case, what's a good example? A good example is a business process outsourcing company. Why? Because it is just instructed by a personal information controller to process data, okay? So if we have an internet service provider and the customer service function is outsourced in a different company, of course, the internet, internet service provider is still the personal information controller because it collects data for the purpose of carrying out internet um, services for, for, for the purpose of uh, meeting the customer's demands. But the customer service uh, company or the, the BPO that processes the customer service requests is asked by the personal information controller to process the data of its data subjects. Okay? Now that we have discussed the basic concepts under the Data Privacy Act, we now move on to the general data privacy principles. After this lecture, if I want you to remember one thing, I want you to remember these general data privacy principles. These are first, transparency, second, legitimate purpose, and lastly, proportionality. Let's go through them one by one. So what do we, do we mean when we say transparency or when we say that the processing of personal information must be transparent? This just means that the data subject must be aware of the nature, purpose, and extent of the processing of his or her personal data, including the risks and safeguards involved the identity of the personal information controller and his or her rights as a data subject. And these rights also include the right to file a complaint with the National Privacy Commission. 
And all these information must be communicated to the data subject in an easy to access and understand manner using clear and plain language. So how can this be communicated by organizations? This could be through a privacy notice. If you notice, when we fill out contact tracing applications, there are usually notices posted outside establishments, which says that they are collecting our personal information for contact tracing purposes. And these information will be deleted after a certain number of days when the uh, purpose has already been accomplished. So these are what we call privacy notices, all right? So next is what we call legitimate purpose. So what do we mean when we say every processing of personal information must have a legitimate purpose? This means that the processing of information shall be compatible with the declared and specified purpose, which must not be contrary to law, morals, or public policy. So for example, in our employment contracts, our employers process our personal information. They collect data about ourselves, for example, um, our name, our address, email address, even our health statuses now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is for the purpose of carrying out the terms of the employment contract. In our example a while ago on COVID-19 tracing uh, forms, right? So the establishments collect our personal information also for the purpose of contact tracing, okay? So consent can also fall under legitimate purposes, okay? But I'd also like you to remember that consent is not the only basis in processing personal information. So remove that from your framework. For example, even, even I make this mistake before, Prior to studying the nitty-gritty details of the Data Privacy Act, I always ask myself, whenever I see that if there is a processing of personal information, my first question is, is there consent? But now I know that this is wrong because consent is not the only basis in the processing of personal information. In fact, it is the weakest basis because consent must be free and um, it must be if it is free and an ambiguous indication of will, which means that when consent is withdrawn, you can no longer process personal information. So, for example, for contracts, for employment contracts, it's not based on consent. It is based on contract. Okay? So, which means that even if, the employee says that, okay, I no longer consent to the processing of my personal information. He or she already signed the contract, which means that the processing is already based on contract. On the other hand, on contact tracing applications or contact tracing forms, these are also not based on consent because the law says that establishments must conduct contact tracing for the purpose of mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic, all right? So lastly, we have what we call proportionality. So this means that the processing of information shall be adequate, relevant, suitable, necessary, and not excessive in relation to a declared and specified purpose, okay? So the question that you should ask here is, is this the least restrictive means of processing personal information in order for you to achieve that desired purpose? For example, in the contact tracing example, do establishments need to get the occupation of the, of the customer or uh, other details about uh, the customer? No, because it's not relevant in contact tracing. Do establishments need that information beyond the quarantine period or beyond the incubation period? Probably not because it's only for contact tracing purposes. Okay, so why do I, um, why did I spend time 
discussing these general data privacy principle, principles. It's because this is the whole framework from which we assess whether a specific processing of personal information is compliant with the DPA. For example, many organizations now are considering using, uh, using artificial intelligence in order to monitor their employees for um, work from home purposes, for various purposes, like it could be productivity, productivity. it could also be fraud uh, for them to make sure that no unauthorized person is using uh, the employee's uh, devices, right? Or they, they, this could also be for privacy purposes because they handle sensitive data and they want to make sure that that data is secure. So when we assess whether this kind of processing is valid, we ask the question, is the organization transparent? Did the organization inform the employees that they are being monitored? And what is the extent of that monitoring, right? So is it 24-7 uh, monitoring? Is it only monitoring when they use company-issued devices? So the organization or the personal information controller must be transparent in this regard. Second, what is the legitimate purpose for using AI for work from home monitoring? Is it only productivity? Is it cyber security? So the personal information controller must really be clear to the purpose because the, that will determine the proportionality of the action. For example, it might not be proportional. Um, I, uh, I discussed a while ago that the question here is, is it the least restrictive means to achieve the desired purpose. For instance, if the uh, desired purpose of the company is to avoid employees uh, to visit certain websites, okay, to prevent employees in visiting specific websites. So maybe the, the company can just choose to uh, block these websites from the company-issued devices and not really monitor the employee 24-7 only for that specific purpose. Or maybe if the uh, the purpose is for cybersecurity, maybe they can take photos before the session, after the session, during lunch break, but not throughout the whole period. We have to remember that when we monitor employees outside of the office space in their own houses, then we are also invading in the privacy of their homes, right? So some employees might not have the luxury of having a specific place only for them, right? So we might also be invading in their personal space. So again, this is the framework that we use in assessing whether a certain processing of personal information is valid or not. Again, what are the general data privacy principles? Transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality, okay? So now we move on. How do we really create a workplace culture of privacy and security? The first one is that we should have organizational security measures in place. One of the obligations of a personal information controller is to have enough security measures. And this will compose of organizational security measures, technical security measures, and physical security measures. But for the purpose of this brief lecture, we focus on organizational security measures because it gives the highest impact into creating a culture of data privacy and security. So the organization should begin in first appointing a data protection officer. So because of the appointment of a data protection officer will fix their organizational structure, uh, the, 
the organization will have a dedicated personnel assigned uh, in making sure that the organization is uh, compliant with data privacy laws. Okay? Okay, so first is to there, appoint a DPO. Okay? So this DPO must, uh, must be uh, knowledgeable in data privacy laws. This DPO should also be knowledgeable about the work of the organization or the kind of processing that the organization does okay so for bigger organizations you can even have compliance officers for privacy because the dpo might not be aware of the uh specific processing of different divisions but there could be a representative from that division uh, who could also be under a dpo next a uh, very important thing trainings okay so you should always conduct trainings uh to your employees uh, this is also a part of building a culture of privacy having uh seminars uh, like this one but i would i would recommend longer seminars in order to discuss in detail the other uh important uh important topics like um technical security measures or organization other uh, organizational security measures physical security measures breach management security management so there's still a lot of things that need to be discussed okay but that starts to build a culture of privacy when you always have annual trainings to your employees uh that will really help create a culture of privacy in your organizations next is to have a privacy by design so what is privacy by design so privacy by design means that privacy is already embedded in every action of your company so it's not really just an afterthought so for example when you um if you're in an organization that considers using a AI for work from home monitoring. You you build the um the software for that, or you build the uh the policies with privacy in mind at the outset. So you need to think what is the legitimate purpose, how can we be more transparent to the employees? Is our uh desired processing proportional uh, to the desired purpose. So it's already embedded in the organization um, side key. So when we, for example, when we create websites uh, for our organizations, this we should also use privacy by design. Do we collect more information that is necessary um, than what is necessary? Okay. So uh, we need to uh, embed privacy in our policies and our decision making. Okay, so that would also help you uh, create a culture of privacy in your organizations. And lastly, how will creating a culture of privacy affect uh, our organizations? Okay, so first is we have a legal standpoint. When we have a culture of privacy, by having a culture of privacy, we can easily comply with applicable statutory rules, right? So again, legal compliance. So as I said, when you already have the DPO, the first task of the DPO is really um, to see whether the organization is compliant with data privacy laws, okay? So it is the obligation of the DPO to ensure that whenever there is a breach, it is reported to the National Privacy Commission that you have an inventory of all your processing activities and you have conducted privacy impact assessments, especially, the, especially when it concerns high-risk processing. Um, for example, AI is one example of high risk processing okay so definitely uh uh 
privacy impact assessment must be done before a uh, company uses that. Okay, next is that um, privacy. A culture of privacy can also help you comply with contracts, okay? So especially when you deal with uh, organizations abroad, most of your clients would be foreign, so they're also applicable laws. So a culture of privacy can help you comply with these applicable laws, okay? We have to remember that law is embedded in every contract. Next is the issue of ethics, okay? So when you have a culture of privacy, your employees and clients also trust you, okay? So it doesn't really mean that you're not violating any law that you should do it, okay? So in this sense, we can say that when you have a culture of privacy, when you value privacy in your organizations, then you will avoid having these ethical mistakes, okay? And lastly, this could also mean um, having the trust of your customers, okay? So um, more often than not, companies who value privacy are trusted more by uh, customers more and more. The uh, customers are being aware of their rights and that is why they would want companies who value their own privacy. Okay? For instance, uh, companies that should not collect more than they should or should dispose information when no longer necessary. So that's a good practice. And lastly, building a culture of privacy, and this is my last point, is strategic. Okay? So it's a great business differentiator. Okay? Privacy can be a great business differentiator and aligning privacy with our organizational goals will also allow us to position our companies as a trustworthy brand. And that is because for the most part, navigating this new normal entails maintaining, building, and creating trust in alternative work arrangements, in alternative and virtual settings, right? And that is why businesses must be able to show their clients that they could provide adequate services, including the protection of personal information, despite a heavier push towards digital and remote work, and while protecting the health and well-being being of its employees, of course. And that ends my presentation for this afternoon. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this assembly. Thank you to our participants for your time and indulgence this afternoon. I'm very sorry that I couldn't join you for the open forum, but you may email me at joan.medalia at privacy.gov.ph and I will answer your questions as soon as I can. This has been Joan Medalia from the National Privacy Commission, and I wish you all a fruitful assembly. Thank you and stay safe. Okay, uh, thank you again, Attorney Joan, uh, for the uh, very informative session. So we have one question here from JT Baroma, uh, which was actually answered already by Attorney Joan Medalia. So does a DPO require to be um, certified or does uh, the NPC offer pre-DPO training or certification? The answer is um, uh, no, the DPO does not need to be certified. And yes, uh, we have DPO ACE or accountability compliance ethics trainings for DPOs depending on your sector. So again, uh, as Attorney John said, uh, you may email uh, Attorney John so uh, she could connect uh, you uh, with you, the uh, sector advisor. So again, thank you very much for um, for uh, for this uh, uh, opportunity, Attorney John Dalia. Okay, um, 
Now that uh, we know how to create a culture of uh, privacy, we can now further organization success through legal, ethical, customer-centric, and uh, strategic um, initiatives.